Uh, hello everyone, good morning. Um, thanks for uh, joining this webcast. Um, so my name is Marco uh, Gargant. I'll be, I'll be uh, uh, talking about open Android and what that means uh, to you and how Android is open or isn't open. Uh, so we'll, we'll discuss those issues. Uh, just a couple of, uh, also a couple of householding um, uh, items. Um, th uh, the slides for this talk are available at this URL. Um, so you can download it uh, in PDF format. Um, and uh, we'll also make, make the screencast um, available as well. Uh, but I think O'Reilly is also doing the same thing. So either way, you're going to get everything recorded, which means you do not need to worry too much about taking notes or anything like that. Now, in terms of uh, going forward, uh, feel free to ask questions at any point. Uh, we have an hour, which is plenty of time. And I will try to figure out how the, the, the chat uh, slash QA Thing works um, so I'll look for questions as we keep on going uh, but uh, I, I really encourage you to make it interactive um, going forward so just a little bit about myself uh, so my name is Marco like I said I started um, uh, my career back in the day on in Java before Java was Java um, it was a project at Sun in those days um, and I did that for for the past you know 10 15 years until um, I came uh, Android came around I, I, when I saw Android I got really interested in that and uh, started playing with the very early releases of the SDK. Um, out of that, I developed Android Bootcamp, a training program for Maracana. And out of that, I ended up uh, doing a lot of training uh, for engineers at some of the biggest uh, mobile companies in the world, such as Qualcomm, Cisco, Motorola, the Department of Defense, um, etc., um, all over the world. So last year, I was on four continents, 11 countries, 36 cities about 170 days of Android training for um, engineers um, around the world. So um, out of that, I sort of saw things that work and don't work in terms of training um, and having people pick up Android. So I wrote that in a book called Learning Android uh, that was recently published by O'Reilly. Um, I also frequently speak at conferences such as OSCON, ACM, IEEE, uh, Sprint Developer Conference, Scandinavian Developer Con Conference, and DevCon, etc. Uh, together with my brother, I started uh, San Francisco Android Users Group, um, which is a meetup in San Francisco. And I am also a co-chair together with uh, Brady from O'Reilly of uh, an upcoming conference called Android uh, Open uh, that's happening in October uh, in San Francisco, October 9th through 11th. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, so this is a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, so we're going to talk about um, a little bit about where Android came about, um, what its history is. And the goal of the history is mostly to kind of give you an idea where it all got started and where it may be going, uh, because that's sort of a, a part of our crystal ball trying to uh, predict the future. We're going to talk a little bit about Android stack. Um, the reason for this is that we need to understand what Android really is. When we say Android operating system, what do we really mean by that? What are the moving parts? What are the components that, that comprise the operating system? Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the meaning of open. Open is one of those things that means different things to different people. Um, so I'm going to kind of double click on that and uh, see uh, what other opinions are there. Um, I'm going to talk about open source uh, software, open standards. I'm going to talk a little bit about op uh, community leadership. And finally, I'm going to look at what open Android means to you from different points of view. So depending on what kind of hat you're wearing at the time, we're going to look at what that would mean to, to you possibly. So with that, let's start a little bit with the history of Android, where it all got started and how we got to where we're at today. So back in 2005, um, there was a company called um, um, Android Inc. that was started by Andy Rubin at the time. Uh, it was a little startup in Palo Alto, and um, we didn't really know much about it other than it was making the, the software for mobile devices. In 2000, uh, so in 2005, um, basically um, Google um, announced that it was purchasing that company and along with it most of the management team and at that time we didn't really also know what Google's goals w with that were. Google wasn't really buying as many companies at the time and it was all, all, everything just sort of happened really quickly and everything sort of just went silent from there on until 2007. In 2007 uh, Google basically announced the creation of Open Handset Alliance, uh, which is the governing body that te technically owns Android. 
Um, and at that time, the, the Open Handset Alliance announced that one of its first products is going to be this thing called Android. And with that, they announced the first software development kit. Um, so that's roughly when we got the SDK 0.9, 1.0. Um, since then, Android basically um, got to a point where it's the dominant, predominant platform for mobile devices. Uh, so pretty much all the devices out there um, you know, are now running Android. And this year, we're seeing a lot of development outside of the mobile uh, phone um, device um, frame set, per se. So we're seeing Android in a lot of uh, gaming consoles, in tablets, in TVs, in cars, in wearable items, and so on. So we're really seeing Android proliferate beyond the phone. So that's sort of where it all got started. One thing that I wanted to point out is the early vision uh, for Android. Uh, back in the day, when uh, into, when Andrew, uh, Google acquired a company, there was a speculation on the street that Google was going to come up with a G phone. That's what people sort of thought was going to happen. Google is entering the mobile uh, market and they're going to create their own device. Um, Eric Schmidt at the time came out and he basically said, look, our goal is not a single device. Our vision is much bigger than that. Our vision is basically to have a mobile platform that's going to run on many, many different devices. So this vision is actually very important because uh, it ends up trickling down into a lot of both business and technical decisions that were made subsequently. So I, I, I think it's historically this is one of the very important um, sort of uh, north stars for, for Android platform um, in general. So with that, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about what Android is, what comprises Android, and what's, you know, what are the, the parts of the Android operating system. So Android uh, stack sort of looks like this. And again, this is a very simplified view of the stack. Um, in, the, the, you know, keeping it very simple with the lines and circles, there's a lot more details that go into, into the picture. But essentially, at the bottom, we have Linux kernel. Um, then we have some native libraries. This is mostly C, C++ code that makes the runs on top of that Linux um, uh, platform. And then we have the specific Android framework that allows us to build apps using um, the platform and leveraging the, the features and capabilities of the platform. And finally, we have applications that run on top of all that. So uh, it's important to understand this stack because when we talk about openness, various parts of the stack have different properties. Um, so that's that's why this is important. And I'm going to sort of explain the various parts of the stack going uh, from the bottom up. So uh, as, as most of you know, Android is built on top of Linux. So at the bottom of it all, we have a Linux kernel. And um, it was initially a standard Linux kernel, but subsequently it's been changed. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, but uh, there, were, there were a couple of, um, you know, uh, good reasons for picking Linux as the foundation for the entire platform. Uh, for one, Linux is fairly secure. So we know a lot about Linux, uh, you know, Linux operating system. It's, it's a system that's been in harsh places over the, over the years and um, it's been fairly secured um, over time. Also, Linux is very portable. We know a lot about the driver model in Linux. So it's fairly easy to port Linux to different devices. And remember, that was one of the goals of the Android project, uh, it build a platform that runs on many, many different platform, uh, devices. And finally, Linux is open source. So those are the good things uh, um, for, for Linux choice. Um, Linux provides things like hardware abstraction, memory management, process management, networking, and some very low level uh, features of the platform are embedded in there. On top of that, we have uh, native libraries. Native libraries, uh, to a certain extent, are things that were needed to basically provide a fully featured comprehensive operating system, system, right? So in an operating system, you need a way to play movies, so you need video codecs, you need a way to play audio, video, you need a way to render HTML, so we needed, uh, we used the WebKit library for that. Um, you needed a database, so we got a SQLite database for that purpose, and so on. On top of that, um, there are also certain things that were developed specifically for Android, such as Bionic, which is essentially a uh, optimized and license-friendly version of libc library that enables developers to build on top of that without uh, license issues. 
um, and as well as the, the hardware abstraction layer, which is a very important feature of Android, uh, which allows um, um, OEMs to basically easily build or port Android to their particular chipsets and devices, etc. So this hardware abstraction layer is, is a very uh, important component of the, the whole library set. Um, so a, a lot of pieces of um, that go into the library, part of the stack uh, are often copy-paste from other open source projects. So not everything was invented for Android, a lot of it was leveraged from other open source projects. Uh, which is a good thing and makes it makes it possible to use the best of breed when it comes to certain libraries and so on. One of the components that we have also at that part of the stack is Dalek. Uh, Dalek is basically a um, a um, um, an implementation of a virtual machine that's purpose built for Android. So in the early days, um, when the team was deciding on the language and so on, they they chose Java uh, because Java is a you know fairly full feature language, uh, but also because Java has a lot of developer uh, community out there. So a lot of people know Java, and so that makes it really easy to uh, adopt uh, Java as a as a language for developing for for Android. Now, while Java language is for the most part quote unquote free and, and so are the libraries and tools, the Java virtual machine was not free. At the time it was owned by Sun, uh, now it's owned by Oracle and basically any vendor that would want to use Java virtual machine would have to uh, do a licensing deal with those companies. Well if you remember Eric Schmidt's goal of having uh, a mobile platform that runs on many many devices, um, this licensing model would not work very well uh, in that case. So basically right from the get-go the team decided to build a purpose-built a friendly virtual machine and that's what Dalvik is. That's from the business standpoint. From technical standpoint Dalvik has been substantially optimized for the use inside of Android um, uh, in, or a mobile device. So basically the team kind of looked at what are the constraints that we're gonna have going forward for a long time uh, that are unlike on, uh, unlikely gonna change anytime soon. So uh, battery, for example, is one of those constraints, and so is the size of the actual, you know, chipsets that we can put into a mobile device. So as such, they decided to optimize Dalvik substantially for uh, for mobile devices uh, that uh, in, that are battery powered, uh, that, and that basically means going with a registry-based uh, chipset versus stack-based and cheaper architecture such as ARM over Intel and so on. So Dalvik's been substantially optimized from a technical standpoint to work very, very well on mobile. Um, and as such, it's very, fairly, uh, is very open and licensed uh, friendly to, to the community. On top of all that, um, we now have application framework. This is the Android application framework. So the application framework is basically a brand new piece of code and it's the code that allows developers to develop applications that run on top of um, the Android um, um, platform. So uh, unlike libraries and Linux pieces that were often copy pasted from other projects and put together to make a whole uh, application framework was de designed from scratch and um, was purpose built for, for Android. And it is, it is it that makes, that exposes the power of the underlying platform up to the application stack. And finally, what we have is are the applications. So we have a gazillion of applications out there running on Android. But also, interestingly, um, we also have many, many markets. So this is another play, uh, thing that we need to consider when we talk about being open, um, and which is unique to Android ecosystem, is that we have many, many different markets. Up until recently, um, Google's own Android market was probably the only one that was kind of dominant and although we could have had many others we didn't really know about them because uh, just of the economics of the marketplaces um, but um, today we have Amazon apps as another marketplace and some other marketplaces are also emerging so that's a good thing it means that uh, there's a sort of uh, more of a competition with, with when it comes to the uh, ability to distribute your application so there are many different channels for distribution uh, giving it giving it more of an open access to the Android market uh, ecosystem so um, with respect to Java, um, I kind of want to touch uh, touch on that as well. Um, Android, uh, like we said before, uh, is 
built using Java, so we write Java uh, applications in, a, in Java and that gets compiled into an Android app at the end of the day. Um, and Android is, uh, for that purposes, Android is using an Apache Harmony uh, version of Java, so it's not really a Sun or not Oracle JDK, so it's, it's, it's an Apache open source version of, um, of Java. And like we said before, that Java really gets compiled into Dalvik executable and runs on Dalvik virtual machine. So it doesn't run on um, Java virtual machine from Oracle um, as we know it. So uh, in terms of getting, uh, you know, being open, it's as open as it gets. And I kind of wanted to point out that this whole um, choice of Java, but also choosing Java um, that runs on a different virtual machine that's slightly modified, actually did quite a few improvements to the Java platform in itself uh, because it made it more suitable for mobile um, in, in environment. We didn't have that before with J2ME or Java ME environment. So that's been a, sort of a big benefit to the Java community in a way. Um, so with that, um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about open. Um, open is Being open is one of those things that everyone agrees that we should be open. Everyone agrees that open is good. But many people have different idea of what open really means to them. So I kind of wanted to explore from a couple of points of view what those ideas or opinions about open are. So um, this is the open source initiative view of open. Basically, this is sort of a, uh, you know, um, a governing body over open source um, and, um, and, and this is their declaration of uh, what it means to be open beyond just getting the actual source code. So, for one, it means that we can, we can have a free distribution of the code. So, if I can basically take that code, I can not only see it, um, and I can also modify it and distribute it. Um, the source code itself is viewable in a, in a human readable fashion. Um, what that means is that it's not going to be intentionally obfuscated or scrambled or uh, in any way made hard for us to, to, to see it. We can create deriv derivative work. So basically we can take um, an open source code, we can build on top of it, and we can create a new piece of code and we can distribute that as well. Integrity of author's source code is protected. So basically what that means is that if I cannot distribute the code with the same license terms, at least I can provide patches to the original source code and that way uh, maintain the integrity of the code. No discrimination against any specific person or group. Uh, that's kind of obvious. No discrimination against any specific field of endeavor. So uh, favoring mobile over de desktop, for instance. Um, Distribution of license, so ability to specify the license for the derived work. License not being specific to a product, per se. Um, no license uh, restrictions. Um, um, uh, um, license must not restrict other software. Um, um, and basically, in license must be technology and technolo technologically uh, neutral. So those are those are some of the um, key points that open source initiative basically lays out as they see what open source software means beyond just getting the source code. Now I wanted to kind of bring in Andy Rubin's definition of open. This was a, this was a tweet uh, that I, I believe this was a very first tweet from Andy um, and um, it was basically in response to uh, Steve Jobs comment that Android is not open um, and basically Andy responded by uh, giving us this command line and for those of you that are not familiar with this, what th this command line would basically uh, um, create a directory, change to that directory, initialize a repo a repository, which is where the source code is. So that's that, this is the location for actual Android platform source code, the entire source code. This would download the source code, and this would make it. So by the end of this command, which would take many, many hours, um, we would essentially have a... Uh, downloaded the entire source code for Android, we would have compiled it, and we would have a version of Android platform that we can now run on an emulator. So that's essentially what that is. So in that sense, uh, you know, we, we meet a lot of uh, requirements of the open source initiative uh, with respect to the source code being available, being easy to, to download it, install it, and, and build it into a working product. Um, so this is Andy's definition of open. In addition to that, I wanted to kind of bring in uh, Jonathan Rosenberg's uh, um, 
post in um, in um, 2009, December 2009, on meaning of open. And this is not so much related to Android as it is related to Google at large. Uh, so just to basically sum up the, the post um, uh, that Jonathan uh, did, um, basically he sees open as a couple of components. So open technology, uh, for one, which means being built on open standards. So, you know, using open standards wherever it's possible. If open standards are not possible, uh, are, are not available, then basically working with the uh, governing bodies to create those standards. So being involved with the standard um, uh, committees and publishing those standards. So that's what it means by being open standards. Um, now, open source, wherever possible, making the code available uh, in terms of the, the actual source code. Um, Jonathan also touches on open information, um, and th that has a lot to do with Google's other products, such as Search and Gmail and so forth. Uh, but basically what he's saying is that it's got to be valuable to user, so users got to understand that they're trading say privacy or something else in exchange for a product that is very valuable for them and they basically have a choice uh, to to make the trade or not um, and that's that's basically very relevant for things like Gmail for instance uh, being transparent about the uh, the information that's collected so you know that's what basically is one of the components of open information knowing what information the organization has on you as a user in control over that information. So Google accomplishes uh, a lot of these things with uh, the dashboard, Google dashboard, uh, which may not be as relevant to Android, but I kind of wanted to give it, uh, put it in a context of, of the bigger view of what open really means. And ultimately, a lot of us agree, I believe, that open systems win, uh, but, uh, but again, uh, it's something that's worth double-clicking on going forward. Um, so finally, I came up with my view of what open means for purposes of Android, and basically what I'm looking at are a couple of things, that that we have the source code, that it's an open source project, right, so that's what I mean, that, that's one of the key components, key pillars of being open in, in my view of things. Uh, that it's based on open standards, wherever available, and if not, making the standards available as the new open, open standards. And also the community leadership. So basically making sure that we have a community that is involved in leading this project. So this is, again, just my view of things. Um, it's somewhat subjective, but uh, it is what it is. So with that, I'm going to look, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, double click on the open source, what that really means. Um, and to understand open source, we got to understand open source licenses. Open source li licenses come in many, many different flavors. Um, there's, if you're interested in actual licenses, I included the link here that outlines all the details of the major and some minor and some proprietary open source licenses. Uh, but at the bottom here, we basically have some of the key licenses that most of you have heard of, such as Apache uh, uh, license, MIT license, BSD license, and then we have various GPL and LGPL licenses available here. So essentially the decision tree, and this is again oversimplified view of the licenses, um, it essentially looks like this. So the, the question, the first question that we have is, does the derivative work fall under the same license? In other words, if we take a piece of open source code and we start building some, something on top of that open source code, do we have to license that open source code under the same terms uh, uh, do we have to license our derivative work under the same terms as the original work or not? So, if it's the case that yes, we must license under the same terms, right? Then the, the, another question becomes: Do we link uh, uh, link to the code under another license and distribute it? Can we do that? Can we basically uh, link to this code and distribute it under a different license? So, if it's a yes, then uh, the, we basically have either uh, LGPL two or LGPL three. Uh, so basically the lesser uh, uh, general public license um, um, license. So the only difference between two and three is can a company bring claims against its users that are using this code and in version two you couldn't and in version three you can. It's very similar with uh, GPL where version two you cannot bring the claim and version three you can. Uh, but basically um, with the GPL code we cannot link to, so it's a no, 
to linking and distributing uh, GPL based code. Uh, now, for Android, one thing that we're trying to do is remember the, the mission many different devices, a platform for many different devices. <coughs> Excuse me. So, to accomplish that, we got to have something that is friendly for vendors to uh, innovate on top of. So, in other words, the license must be such that if I am an OEM, um, I can basically build custom code on top of that. And I can, if I choose, I can keep that code secret sauce. So that's why a lot of code that we want in Android, we're basically saying, no, we do not necessarily want to have to license under the same terms. We can, but we don't want to be forced to. So that basically opens up a couple of license choices. Apache, MIT, and BSD, right? And with respect to that, uh, the, the differences are more or less subtle. So basically... Apache code means that every single piece of code will um, need to specify at the top of the code that it's, you know, the information about its patents, copyrights, as such. So it needs to be a fairly clean piece of code that we can use. So it's probably one of the most uh, generous uh, sort of open source licenses um, out there, so the Apache license. Now, if it doesn't have to do that, the question really becomes, can we use the, uh, the brand uh, uh, for promotion or not? And MIT allows that, and BSD doesn't. Uh, so, th those changes are l more or less subtle in the green scheme of things, and basically for Android, we're trying to kind of use this set of licenses wherever possible uh, for the code in order to accomplish that mission of having many people uh, uh, be able to uh, see it. Are you guys having problems with the screen again? Um, do we need to limit? It sounds like some of you. Okay. No, nope, everything everything was good, Marco. Oh, everything's good. Okay, good. Okay, so then it must have been an old chat. Got it. Um, so, so with that, let me then uh, move on to the next slide. And basically, now that we understand the stack, um, we can now take a look at where do specific licenses licenses fit in the big scheme of things of Android. So, at the at the top of it all. Um, we have some uh, we have apps right so of course users can uh, developers can build their own custom apps and those apps are extremely proprietary to those developers and they you know they do not want to distribute them but the apps that that come with android open source project are open meaning the source code is available they're licensed under apache license and we can we can we can study them we can learn from them we can repurpose them build on top of them etc so it's fairly open for the apps that come with android open source project which is not a lot it's a handful of apps so the standard home screen contacts phone browser settings etc so these those default applications are available uh, but uh, certain applications such as Google Maps or you know Android market are not those are proprietary apps that belong to Google so they're not uh, part of the Android open source project and uh, as such they don't it's not really something we're considering here in terms of the application framework, this is fairly open. Um, it's as open as it gets. It's a, a pretty much everything licensed to the Apache 2 license, um, and we have the source code, and it's very well documented, etc. So that code is open, and there's really not a lot of concerns about that piece of code at all. When we come to the library section of the stack, um, Keep in mind that a lot of these bits and pieces here have been co uh, copy-pasted from other open source projects. So as such, they can carry various licenses. Most of them tend to be Apache, BSD, or uh, MIT licenses. So in other words, one of those friendly licenses where you can build a derivative work on top of it and not, uh, not worry about that too much. Um, so, but, but there are various licenses just because of the nature that it came from many, many different places. Uh, when it comes to Dalvik, Dalvik is, uh, is open. Um, the source code is, uh, is available. It's un licensed under Apache 2. And uh, more so, uh, Dalvik is fairly portable. In other words, it's a, it's something, it's a piece of code that we, we, uh, OEMs should easily be able to recompile for their particular chipsets. Um, just uh, just so you know so so that's fairly uh, good in terms of that one thing that I would mention in, when it comes to libraries is bionic uh, bionic is basically uh, more or less a replacement for libc library so libc library is uh, based uh, is the standard c library and it's based on an lgpl license uh, license which 
uh, would mean that any code that is linking to it would have to qualify under LGPL terms, right? So um, that would not work very well with vendors who want to build on top of Android but keep their secret sauce secret. So as such, uh, the Android team basically rewrote most of that into the Bionic library. So that's uh, so, and that's now licensed under BSD license, I believe. Um, so finally, we have the lower uh, uh, part of the stack uh, where Linux is and um, a lot of drivers are. And this part of the stack is, um, is mostly either proprietary when it comes to drivers or it's licensed under GPL code when it comes to um, uh, kernel itself, the Linux kernel itself. Right, so um, basically, this is where it gets a little tricky um, to uh, to uh, essentially take Android and just port it. A lot of people say, "Hey, you know, if Android is so open and I have the source code available, how come I can't just download it, build it, and you know, put a new version on my Evo or on my uh, Zoom or whatever device you may have?" And the issue is really the drivers. The drivers. They happen to be proprietary, so HTC, Motorola, Samsung, they they have their own chipsets, they have their own drivers for those chipsets, and they tend not to want to open those things to, to, to the rest of the world. So what happens is, in theory, we can easily build Android and run it on a device, but as long as that device is something like an emulator or a device that, that, that for which drivers are very, very well known. Um, in, so that's in theory. In practice, a lot of consumer devices, we do not have these drivers, so we cannot just simply uh, port onto the device. And that, 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 that's been uh, something that's been kind of slowing down the, you know, that whole um, discipline of, of developing custom, custom ROMs and installing it on uh, proprietary uh, devices. So that's basically what's going on uh, with respect to that. Uh, with respect to uh, hardware abstraction layer, that's basically that piece that comes here that tries to make it as abstract as possible for the actual hardware imp implementation so that the rest of the system doesn't suffer from those proprietary things. So essentially, this is a sort of a happy medium um, of keeping the system open yet uh, giving some power to the actual OEMs to control their devices and make sure that you know they they um, they, they have certain proprietary things in there as well. But that's basically openness of the stack. Now, Honeycomb is an interesting uh, black sheep in the family of uh, Android releases, um, and with respect to that, basically Honeycomb uh, doesn't we don't have the source code for Honeycomb. As a matter of fact, we never will. Uh, apparently, so initially, what we were told was that um, you know by the team was that they were just super busy working on the Honeycomb code, and it was a substantial diff change in the actual version of, of Android. So they were just had their heads down uh, working on this, and they had no no time to polish the code and make it uh, available. That was in the initial thought, uh, the initial uh, talk from Google. Um, subsequently, they have actually said that, look, the code is probably never going to be available to general public. Now, from everything that, uh, you know, I gathered in research, it seems like that this is more an exception than a rule. So, going forward in Ice Cream Sandwich, uh, things should get back to normal. So, we should have the source code available uh, and, and for general public and able to download it and build it and so on. So, it seems like that this is more of an exception than a rule. Uh, going forward, but as uh, but currently Honeycomb uh, code is not available at all. When it comes to Linux, um, things are also interesting, and it's also a uh, it's it's something that creates a certain contention uh, in the community with, between the Linux community and the Android community. So, like we said, Android is built on top of Linux, um, but Android Steam, um, you know, basically forked. Linux and Linux and, and made a different version of the kernel. Uh, they have extended it for purposes of the mobile, um, and some of those extensions include power management, wake clocks, things of that nature. Now, subsequently, um, the since a Linux is GPL code, um, that would require the the changes to the code to be published back to the community. Apparently, Google initially wasn't very good at doing that. Um, and the reason for that was that they were essentially too busy, um, or, or so, so, so you know, so we hear, and essentially the, a lot of those changes weren't initially pushed. 
to the community. Uh, Google did address that by hiring a couple of people to um, focus exclusively on working on pushing the changes back to, to the kernel. Uh, but by that time, I, th uh, I, I believe that the Linux community sort of uh, didn't like the behavior and they even started rejecting some of those changes and, um, and a lot of those changes have to do with the power management. So currently, a lot of those changes are still in a separate fork and are not accepted by the, the Linux community. So that's, that's sort of what's going on in terms of that uh, with respect to Linux and Android. Um, so that's the meaning of, you know, open source uh, software. The next thing that I want to talk a little bit about are open standards. Open standards are obviously very important, um, especially when you're building an ecosystem. Um, if you have the you know different standards, then the the power of that ecosystem is dramatically diminished. Uh, a good example of initial open standards was the railway network. Uh, we initially had many different um, uh, widths for the railways and that would basically not allow for a train to travel from one part of the country to another. Um, this, this initial standards war was resolved by an actual war of the North and the South, and, uh, and basically the South had to convert uh, mile, uh, miles and mi miles of its railways to be, uh, meet the, the standard, uh, which is, I believe, eight feet and, uh, eight and uh, uh, four feet and eight and a half inches in, in width. Uh, but it just shows the power of of, of a standard. So I wanted to kind of explore what happens with Android with respect to standards. Um, and um, in terms of that, I'm going to look through the prism of, you know, basically using open standards wherever possible. Um, when the standards are not available but proprietary solution exists, uh, essentially leaving a slot for, so that the proprietary solution could be plugged in and used as an alternative. And finally, uh, creating standards wherever they're needed. So we're in a new realm, a lot of standards do not exist, so they need to be created and they need to be exposed as standards. So that, that and, and this, uh, this kind of view of things um, sort of matches Jonathan Rosenberg's view of the meaning of open as well. So it's, it's a close approximation of uh, what it means to be based on open standards. So I'm going to kind of give you a couple examples um, of standards in Android. Um, I've got two. One is media support. So as we know, there are many, many different codecs and media formats out there, both for audio, video, images, and so forth. And essentially, Android, wherever possible, provided support for those media codecs. So everything, essentially everything that was available in the open source community that is licensed under the terms that makes sense uh, for the vision of Android were basically tossed into the mix and made available as part of the platform. However, there are bits and pieces that are not available in open source community. They tend to be proprietary, right? So Microsoft may have a proprietary media uh, uh, framework, Apple may have its own media framework, etc. So in that case, what Android team basically did is they left a slot open for those uh, those formats to be made available. In other words, they did not want to pollute the stack with throwing in some proprietary code, but rather they left a uh, slot open uh, for other integrators to basically build those, uh, um, plug in those, those um, uh, codecs and support for those in that media. Um, in this case, we are using something called uh, Kronos OpenMax IL uh, to provide the extensibility of the platform when it comes to media. But I kind of wanted to just kind of give you this as more of a flavor of how things work inside of Android and opening things that are potentially uh, proprietary. Another example that is often uh, being uh, you know asked about by the enterprise customers is the support for VPN. So according to Google, the Android supports VPN for a while now. But according to uh, enterprises, the VPN that Android supports are nothing that the enterprise customers actually use or care about. So enterprise customers, they want to use Cisco VPN, Juniper VPN, etc. Um, now, it's not possible really to put in support for Cisco proprietary VPN into an otherwise open source project. So for that reason, um, Android team has essentially left a slot open, in this case, in a form of an of a, a open source framework called Raccoon that enables it to, um, to add a support for that. So what that means is that um, the uh, vanilla Android open source project does not have support for any enterprise-grade VPN. However, 
if a specific uh, OEM such as Samsung or Motorola want to do a side deal with Cisco, they can and they can easily plug in and extend their version of Android to support that uh, VPN solution. So these are just sort of two examples of uh, you know open standards and opening um, slots and keeping things available where they're not necessarily available in the open source community. Um, finally, the third thing that they have here is uh, look at the community leadership, what that really means and how Android is doing um, in terms of that. I think it's an important component of uh, any open uh, project open open system um, so Google did initially in 2007 create an alliance called open handset alliance they basically said look this thing Android is going to be much bigger than us if we're going to accomplish our vision and as such we're going to basically create an alliance that owns this project so in theory there's an alliance of initially 30 some now 80 plus members um, comprised of all sorts of OEMs, chip manufacturers, vendors, carriers, software companies and such that care about mobile and t technically Open Handset Alliance owns Android project right so the alliance um, is the, the goal of the alliance is to improve mobile experience for everyone and they are jointly working on Android. Now that's theory. In practice, Google seems to be the one who has a lot of muscle behind this alliance. And a lot of things be uh, in terms of how the alliance operate are simply unknown to us. We do not know about a lot of licensing terms. We do not know a lot of uh, uh, about a lot of um, uh, basically deals that go that come with the membership in the alliance um, as as a public. So that's the open handset alliance. One of the things when considering the uh, community leadership is the roadmap. In a standard, when you think about open source project, you basically think about a group of people who came together with the same, with the common need of building a better something. It, it, that could be an operating system, it could be a web server, whatnot. And they basically share their needs and they distribute the work uh, among themselves and things get done. Android is not like that. Android basically has a very private roadmap. Essentially, Google uh, has its agenda where it's going with Android, and we do not know uh, a lot about what's going to come in the next release until the big ta -na 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 moment and the actual release of the SDK. So we're not privy to the roadmap, we're not privy to the source code in terms of the nightly builds or anything like that until the actual moment when the product is released. So this is one point where Android is quite different than other operating, uh, open source projects in, in, in the classic way of open source projects. Um, Google does solicit community input uh, and they jot those notes down somewhere but um, in, in terms of promises or or priorities none of that is really uh, uh, known to us at, uh, at this point so basically they do get our input but they still uh, keep their own map somewhat private in terms of where it's going um, one thing that kind of came up recently is the uh, the concept of bear hugging essentially picking a favorite OEM um, for each release. So in the early days, uh, Google worked very closely with HTC on G1, Dev1 phone, the very first Android phone, the Nexus one, and so on. Later on, Google switched to Nex uh, Samsung for Nexus S release, and most recently to Motorola for, for its Zoom uh, plat uh, uh, tablet device. Um, so, and it seems that um, the different OEMs get different terms. According to uh, the, uh, there was a lawsuit recently uh, that involved Skycook, and uh, so a certain proceeds of that lawsuit uh, essentially leaked out. Uh, according according to that, the terms of the deals with Samsung are different in terms of the deals with Motorola, and and, and that's something that's unclear why. But that information seems to be private. Um, it's an interesting view. It's an interesting how uh, Google sees um, themselves with respect to Android. Um, I initially thought of. Android more like uh, Microsoft Windows, where it's an operating system that runs on many, many different platforms, regardless of what the platform is. But Andy Rubin recently said in an interview that he sees Android uh, and Google more like Apple, essentially working very closely with a specific OEM, making sure that they get it right for that specific device. Um, and, and that's basically their entire focus for each release is one single device. And that's essentially they work so closely with that device manufacturer. Um, so that's basically what's going on in terms of uh, how the releases uh, get shipped out on particular for particular devices.
Um, there's also something called compatibility test suite, uh, which is essentially one of the leverage points that Google uses to uh, essentially, um, um, you know, quote unquote, force manufacturers into uh, creating a certain type of Android uh, device. Um, this, for users, is a good thing because, from user standpoint, um, having too many different versions of Android would just create confusion. Um, and by having it somewhat unified via CTS, uh, it's a good thing for for users. Um, it is a leverage. Uh, over OEMs, basically forcing them into uh, certain behavior that may they may or may not care about. Um, and there was a there was a recently a leaked email as well uh, from Dan Merrill uh, saying how basically it's a club to to force OEMs into certain behavior. Um, but um, the way I see the CTS is also as a sort of like a crystal ball to um, to kind of give us an idea what may be on that roadmap that we don't know much about. Uh, by, by reading through CTS uh, and understanding the difference between uh, that s some features should be there, must be there, or is optional, you can sort of extrapolate what the goals of the next release of Android are. So that's kind of my view of things. It's a, it's a crystal ball into the future of things to come. Um, so um, Google's motivation for this initially was to basically create a level uh, playing field for the mobile, so Google was very successful in in the internet because internet is such as open such an open platform. Uh, but when it came to mobile, you basically have carriers and OEMs controlling the platform, and it's a very much an oligopoly um, um, out there. So it makes it hard to compete fairly. And Google wanted to create a platform that makes it easier for them to uh, to uh, compete fairly in the mobile space, which is the fastest growing. Uh, space um, at the moment and uh, again money comes from mobile ads uh, but certain uh, other services provide a leverage in terms of um, accomplishing the level playing field there was an interesting talk by uh, Bill uh, Gurley of uh, uh, Benchmark Capital and uh, he quoted basically uh, Warren Buffett how he sees Google um, and essentially, Warren Buffett says, you know, in, in business, I look for castles that are surrounded with unbreachable moats um, to protect that specific business. So in Google's case, the castle is AdWords. That's where the money comes from. And essentially, one way to look at what Google, uh, Google's strategy is that everything else is essentially is a big moat to protect that castle. So Android is uh, something that, that controls uh, the access between the user and the search, and as such, it plays a, cr a critical role um, in, uh, in in protecting the AdWords business model. Um, this is a, uh, this is an interesting view because it also tells us that. Um, Android is not something that ever has to make money for Google. So as such, it's a very strong play against all the other platforms which do have to mon make money from licensing uh, fees and, and or selling gizmos. Uh, Google doesn't. It's essentially it's it's a less than free product for them that uh, that is just there to protect something totally different. So what does all this mean to you? What does being open mean to you at the end of the day? And I'm going to look at this through a couple of different prisms, a couple of different points of view. Um, so as a user, being open um, is, is great. I can customize my device. Um, I can make the device all about me, right? That was the whole T-Mobile advertising, it's all about you kind of thing. Um, I can even change the entire flavor of Android. If I don't like what my carrier gives me, I could put another version of, um, of Android on a device altogether. So as a user, things are good. As a developer, um, being open means that, um, and, and this concept of being open that, that we have with Android, means that my apps are going to run on many, many different devices. So unlike Linux, where an app is not going to run from a flavor of Linux to a flavor of Linux, Linux, on Android it will, for the most part. Right? It also means that I have a huge platform, huge market to distribute my apps through. Um, and it also means that I can also study a lot about how the platform works from seeing the in ins and outs of the platform. So this is something that's unique from developer standpoint in Android, unlike other platforms. Um, as a manufacturer, as an OEM, on one hand, things are great. I get to I get an awesome operating system, 
um, um, fully featured operating system and I basically just get to load it onto my device and off I go. So things are great because I get to innovate at a much higher uh, point as opposed to rebuilding uh, the wheel I get to just basically plug it into my device. So those are good things about um, uh, about Android for an OEM. Um, on, the, on the flip side of the coin if unless I'm, I'm the favorite I may not be the one who is privy to the source code. So in other words, um, it, um, if certain OEMs can get essentially uh, um, early access to the code and in sometimes even up to six months, which was the case with Honeycomb, and that means that's a very long time in, in mobile industry. So that is not so, not so good for OEMs. Um, uh, similarly, OEMs uh, may not know what's coming in the next release, so they can't really plan well for the, the upcoming releases as well. So that's kind of like the flip side of a coin for OEMs and being open. As a carrier, carriers love Android, um, basically because their users love Android. It's an alternative to, uh, to iPhones, so unless you have to deal with Apple, this is a really good alternative. Uh, there are many different OEMs. Um, available, so lots of different phones to choose from, uh, but it's unclear who's supporting Android, and how how do we lock a device down for customers for the enterprise customers? So this is something that I'm hearing a lot from uh, from the um, enterprise customers. And finally, for enterprises, um, things are good because uh, there are many productivity apps available for Android. So it's a platform that it's fairly easy to develop productivity apps. makes your staff, your employees more productive. And your employees also bring their own best-of-breed devices into the organization, which is great. But on the flip side, how do we lock down a device? How do we make sure that a employee doesn't bring in a rogue device into a company or has a virus on a device or something of that nature? How do we make sure the data is not leaking via that device? Also, if I'm an enterprise um, uh, IT manager, how do I build a custom ROM? How do I create my own image if that's the direction that I'm going to go down on? Um, so that's something that is not very easy today. It's technically, uh, te uh, pr uh, technically doable, but practically hard to do. Um, also, do we have a company-issued phone or do we allow um, uh, devices to come in from, personal devices to come in from users? That's another uh, uh, debate out there. Currently, you st st uh, the standard policy is to have a company-issued BlackBerry and a personal iPhone or similar. But going forward, Google sees that as more of a single device strategy where people are going to bring a single device into the organization and it's going to basically have their company um, and it's going to be able to connect to their company network. So how do we get to that? That's sort of unclear at the moment as well. But third parties are working on that and that's where being open sort of helps, although it's incomplete at the moment. Um, so overall, my summary, uh, in terms of the open source, I give Android a uh, three stars. Uh, basically, most of the code is open and it's open source. Certainly, everything that comes from Google is open source in terms of um, the Android open source project. However, the big deal is that OEMs still keep uh, a lot of bits and pieces uh, proprietary. So yes, you can build um, for emulator, but building for Evo or Zoom is going to be extremely hard uh, for, for somebody to do. Um, in terms of open standards, um, I think Android is doing pretty well when it comes to open standards. It's trying to be very open about everything. Uh, wherever uh, openness is not available, uh, uh, slots are made available for particular um, devices. And um, so I give it four stars in terms of adhering to open standards. In terms of community leadership, uh, I, I give Android uh, two stars at most. And basically, it's mostly due to the lack of public roadmap. We don't know what's coming out next. We don't know much about Ice Cream Sandwich or any other release. Um, and we do not have access to, to, uh, to the source code. So uh, this is something that is very atypical for um, an, an open source project not to know what's coming up and not to have the nightly builds available to us. So that's my overall rating for Android. These are the references and attributions for this. And essentially, as a summary, like I said, 
bits and pieces. Uh, most of the Android is uh, uh, open source and it's friendly. And uh, but the devil is in the detail. Running it on a physical device and building it is going to be hard. Um, and it's not a typical open source project. It's a quite a, quite a different beast when it comes to Android and how it's organized. Um, and um, and you know that's sort of striking the balance between being open but at the same time protecting the users and also uh, protecting the OEMs and carriers in terms of their existing business models. So uh, so that's basically my view of how Android is open and what that should mean to you. So I guess uh, we are at the end of the uh, uh, slot, uh, but I'm still open for questions. Great. Okay, Marco, we do have some questions that came in, and I'll gladly read them to you. We have an attendee, Metazad, asks, is the license assigned to Android not strongly based on JDK license? Um, so, um, in terms of J JDK, as in Java Developer Kit that comes from Oracle, uh, Android doesn't really have anything to do with that. So, um, Android is using the uh, ha uh, Apache Harmony version of Java, which is licensed under Apache License 2, which is one of the friendliest open source li licensing uh, licenses out there. And it's running on Dalvik, so it, it really doesn't have a lot to do with JDK, although this is something that Oracle would strongly disagree with me on, or with Google or anyone else. Okay, and we have Alec asks, any possibility of using Creative Commons classifications for open source code licensing? Um, Creative Commons, I'm, I'm not so sure how Creative Commons um, licenses uh, work with respect to open source. Creative Commons license is based on US copyright law and as such it protects the actual code but it doesn't really have anything to do with it. things like what happens when you uh, create an executable out of that original you know, code, what happens when you run that executable, what happens when you link to that ex executable. So as such Creative Commons is much lesser of a protection uh, because it's only protecting the actual code base itself, no derivative work. And one thing that's very important to us here is how do we relate to the actual derivative work of Android? Um, so how do we build on top of that? You know, can, event, can OEM build secret sauce? Um, can innovate to the higher level? Those sorts of things are very, very important, um, not, not just protecting the actual words, which is... Uh, what Creative Commons does. Creative Commons is more structured for uh, for you know, basically protecting uh, you know um, other works of uh, authorship uh, out there, uh, but not so much software. Great. Those are all the questions that came in today. So at this time, Marco, we would like to thank you for that wonderful and informative presentation. We thank all the attendees that joined us today, and we hope you've benefited from today's webcast. We would like to remind you to mark your calendars for Wednesday, July 20th. That will be our next OSCON webcast at 10 o'clock Pacific time, titled What's New and Cool in Drupal 7? Again, we thank you all for joining us today. Marco, thank you very much. Everyone, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, guys.